Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. I'm delighted to welcome you to this first webinar hosted by the Wilberforce Institute at the University of Hull. Um, today's event is uh, concerning revolutionary uh, activities in 1760 to 61 in Jamaica, uh, often referred to as Tacky's Revolt. I'm Diana Payton. I'm a professor of history at Edinburgh University, and I'm going to be the chair this afternoon. I'm a historian of the Caribbean and of slavery and its aftermath. I'm not um, affiliated with the Wilberforce Institute, but I'm very happy to have been invited to chair today. So this afternoon, we're going to have five short presentations uh, and then followed by a, a response. Um, after the six, um, well, the five presentations and the response, there'll be questions, which um, we'd ask you to send um, by writing them uh, using the questions tab, which is to the right of your screen. Uh, you can obviously submit your questions at any time, but we're going to save them until uh, all the presentations and the response uh, have been delivered. Uh, and we think there should be about 45 minutes uh, at the end for questions. Um, I'll read out the questions to the, the speakers uh, because the platform we have here means that you in the audience can't be heard uh, or seen. Uh, it's given that we've got a lot of people here today, uh, nearly 200 people, we may not be able to ask all the questions, but um, any question that we don't get to uh, will pass to the speakers at the end. Um, so as I said, uh, we have five speakers today uh, and I'll introduce each one um, and then uh, bring them in. Uh, each speaker will speak for uh, around 10 minutes. Uh, so our first speaker is Professor Vincent Brown. Uh, Professor Brown is Charles Warren Professor of History at Harvard University. Uh, and he is the author most recently of Tacky's Revolt, the story of, a, of an Atlantic slave war, which just came out at the end of last year. Uh, so over to you, Vincent. Oh, well, thank you, Diana. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you um, and with, with the audience and also with my, my co-panelists, this, this fellow speakers. This is really an all-star panel of historians that I've learned so much from in my own work. Uh, and it's just a real pleasure to be with them here today to talk about Tacky's Revolt. I'm gonna jump right into it uh, and then give you a sense of what I think are some of the implications of this revolt for the way we research the history of slavery and slave revolt. But I'm gonna kind of focus real deeply on one particular case. A man called Wager, also known by his African name, Abongo, was one leader of the largest slave revolt in the 18th century British Empire. On the night of May 25th, 1760, he was with a group of other Africans just outside the plantation great house of Mays Muir Estate in Jamaica, when the managing attorney, John Smith, a female friend, the overseer, and a bookkeeper gathered for a Whitson holiday supper with several others. The guests remarked upon how still and quiet everything was. Without warning, someone fired a musket through the window, immediately killing Smith. Then all at once, African rebels rushed into the house with cane knives to slay the slaveholders. This attack initiated the second great uprising in the series of events that have come to be known as Tacky's Revolt. But before taking his part in the Great Jamaica Insurrection of 1760 to 61, Apongo had been a military official in West Africa during a period of imperial expansion and intensive warfare there. He had once been a notable guest of John Cope, governor of Cape Coast Castle, Britain's principal fort on the Gold Coast. Captured and sold as a slave, Apongo became the property of Captain Arthur Forrest of the British Royal Navy, renamed Wager. Apongo came in chains to Forest Maysmere Plantation in the parish of Westmoreland, where he again encountered John Cope, who had retired to his own plantation in the same parish. Occasionally, Cope would entertain his acquaintance from the old world, even laying out a tablecloth for Sunday visits, treating the slave as a man of honor, and insinuating that Apongo would one day be redeemed and sent home. Whatever understanding there was between the two men, did not outlast John Cope's death in 1756. And sometime over the next several years, Wager began plotting, organizing, and awaiting an opportune moment to launch his war against the whites. 
Now, scholars of slavery are familiar with slave rebels who reacted against the conditions of enslavement by striking violently against their masters. And historians of Africa have examined the predicament of captives of elite status who fell into the hands of slavers and were subjected to the indignities of plantation life in the Americas. But scholars have yet to give sustained attention to the complex patterns of alliance and antagonism over time and across vast distances that define relationships like that between Opongo, John Cope, and Arthur Forrest. Cope spent a tumultuous few years in West Africa, taking the opportunity of internecine African strife to enhance the fortunes of the British slave trade. During his time there, the British shipped more than 35,000 men, women, and children from the region into slavery, allowing Cope to acquire a comfortable life in Jamaica, Britain's most profitable colony. Wager's enigmatic life story encompasses an unlikely odyssey from the administrative councils of West African statecraft to a Royal Navy warship on active duty, to the sugar plantations of Jamaica, into leadership of a massive slave uprising, and finally, to his summer execution on the public gibbet. Arthur Forrest, the naval officer and sugar planter, fought commendably in the Seven Years' War, Britain's most celebrated military triumph of the 18th century, which historians often call the First European World War even while forest slaves staged the empire's greatest servile rebellion. These men were all traveling the main arteries of Atlantic empire, but their divergent paths suggest alternative ways of mapping the Atlantic world beyond those of official plans and diagrams. Intertwined life histories like theirs are poorly understood. Stories of displacement, belonging, and political predicament that link the transatlantic slave trade to what I call diasporic warfare. Diasporic warfare involved a process of dispersal, transplantation, and adaptation familiar to students of cultural change. And like black cultural phenomena, slave insurrection drew African, American, and Atlantic history into a common frame. Because even local conflicts in Africa and the daily hostilities of slave life could, as they shape the capacities of future slave rebels, reverberate across the Americas and up to the scale of transatlantic empire. More than highlighting resistance or the agency of the dispossessed, the Jamaican insurrection of 1760 to 1761 in this view helps us to chart the martial geography of Atlantic slavery as its turmoil ruptured and reconfigured systems of social authority and cultural continuity dispersing enslaved militants far and wide. Now that is how I conceive what we normally call Tacky's revolt. But I should note that I begin with Wager rather than Tacky himself, in part because we have more sources beyond the customary histories uh, by the planters Edward Long and Brian Edwards, who were written in the 18th century to form the basis of most of our knowledge of these events. I have more sources about him as an individual and the kinds of relationships he had with these other slaveholders that gives us a sense of this story as something that did not just take place on a plantation, did not just take place within a colony, but took place on the scale of Atlantic empire and Atlantic slavery. That geography is really what I'm trying to explore here. So very briefly, let me talk about the sources because our host, uh, Trevor Bernard, wanted us to talk about the challenges we faced in different kinds of sources. And oftentimes in black studies and especially in the history of slavery, we talk about the difficulty of these sources which silence black voices, which prevent us from learning what we want to know about black subjectivity in slavery. And that is certainly the case here. But we can push beyond those sources by triangulating around a number of different repositories uh, and things that were said. So in this case, I not only started with the diary of Thomas Dissowood, and I'm grateful to Trevor Bernard for uh, allowing me to use his transcriptions of that diary from 1760 to 1761. And it's Thomas Dissowood's diary that lays out this connection between John Cope, a Pongo in West Africa, and the slave rebel wager in the Americas, even suggesting that he may have sailed on uh, Arthur Forrest's warship of the same name. So what that led me to do was to go back to the sources on the Royal African Company forts and look through the receipts of castle expenses, looking for a Pongo's name, looking for when John Cope might have encountered a Pongo as they treated diplomatically on the West African coast. Now, I'll reveal something. I never quite found a Pongo. I found, found several names that looked like a Pongo. But what I found instead of an exact match 
was a set of possibilities for Af African military and diplomatic officials who treated with John, John Cope, who themselves might have been enslaved at a later period and ended up in Jamaica. So not just one person, but a whole set of people who could have had those kinds of experiences and brought them to Jamaica. The second major source set of sources I used were the letters of the Royal Navy, letters from ship captains, uh, also ship logs, which told me where these Royal Navy ships were uh, in the Atlantic, but also around Jamaica over time, and also especially the musters, where I found the name of Wager on the muster of the HMS Wager. But I also found the names of several other sailors with African Akan names. What that suggested to me was, again, it was not only Wager who had that experience sailing with the British Royal Navy in wartime, but these other Africans who shared that, who shared that experience. Again, kind of drawing a broader picture of the kinds of experiences that Africans brought with them to the slave revolt. And finally, within Jamaica, we have the plantation records that we use, the newspaper accounts, especially that of the Pennsylvania Gazette. <clears throat> And so I was able to develop a composite biography of Wager, Apollo, and people who had similar kinds of experiences who ended up in Jamaica and were involved in this slave revolt. And what that suggests to me as I, as I finish is that even though we certainly will know more about the enslavers than the enslaved, we see in these sources that the actions of the enslaved shape the sources and the people they describe as surely as wind and water shape the contours of stone. And that is what I want to leave us with uh, for our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent. That's really uh, fascinating um, compilation of discussion of sources there. Um, I'm going to move on now to our second speaker, which is Professor Edward Rujima. Uh, Edward Rujima is the Associate Professor of History and African American Studies at Yale University, uh, and he is author of Slave Law and the Politics of Resistance in the Early Atlantic World. So over to you. Thank you, Diana, for the introduction, and thank you, Trevor, for the invitation. And um, it is it is an honor to be on this panel with such esteemed scholars, um, all of whom I've learned a tremendous amount from. So I want to talk about two things. First, I'd like to begin by, by situating Tacky's Revolt within the longer history of Jamaica during the 18th century. Okay, let's open up the, um, the angle and look, and look at it from a broader perspective. And secondly, I'd like to offer a few thoughts on how we understand the word Coromanti. Because Tacky's Revolt is often called the Coromanti War. The Coromantes as a group were critical, or often, most scholars believe they're critical to this rebellion. And so how do we understand that group within the development of Jamaican history? So to begin with the place of Tacky's Revolt within the 18th century, I want to preface these remarks with the observation that in the aftermath of this revolt, the plantation system continued to be as productive as ever. Sugar production does decline for a couple of years after the revolt, but within three, four years, again, it, it continued to expand. Production numbers are very high, and it continues to expand really until the end, until the end of slavery in the 1830s. Investors continued to sink capital into Jamaica, and this is evident in the continued expansion of the transatlantic slave trade into Jamaica, which brought about 10,000 enslaved Africans to the island every year. The revolt was incredibly destructive. It was very expensive for the colonial state to suppress it. But the system that had developed earlier in Jamaica's history, that remained intact. Okay? Now, I've argued that the reason this was so was because this slave society, Jamaican slave society, had become deeply militarized okay, by the long series of wars with the Maroons. It is commonly called the First Maroon War, um, which began with the English conquest of the island in 1655 okay, and continues until the treaties signed with the Maroons in 1739. Okay? It's during this period, especially during the 1720s, 
when the colonial state of Jamaica establishes the pattern of confronting slave revolt. And this consists of three principal steps. First, establishing martial law, which ordered every white man between the ages of 15 and 60, okay, to come out for militia duty, okay, and to parade and to um, and to suppress the resistance that, that had been reported. Secondly, it's the establishment of funds for the hiring of enslaved men um, called black shots or called pioneers, um, sometimes to fight um, and more often to assist the white militia in moving material and food and everything needed to, to suppress these um, rebellions. Okay, And finally, during this period in the 1720s, you see the establishment of a permanent garrison of British troops in the island for internal use of the governor to suppress re resistance wherever it emerged. Okay, these are the tactics that, that Jamaica slaveholders adopted, okay, and developed over a, a significant period of time to confront endemic slave resistance, which was a part of the society from the very beginning. Okay, after the treaties. Okay, Jamaica's military apparatus to confront slave revolt was even stronger because the treaties stipulated that the Maroons would come to the assistance of the colony in the suppression of slave revolts when they would emerge again. Okay. And so the rebels led by Taki and by a Pongo or Wager, they faced a powerful military apparatus that had been born of the military struggle between their rebel predecessors, namely the Maroons, okay, and their common oppressors, namely the slaveholders. Okay, so that political dynamic of slave resistance and repression, okay, had fostered the emergence of a militarized slave society that was very successful and continued, despite the destruction of Tiger's Revolt. Now to move on to the Coromanti. The Coromanti play a critical role throughout this history, but I'd also argue that the Coromanti as a group were also a product of this history. The word Coromanti stems from a place name, Coromantine, which is the first place in West Africa where English merchants made an agreement with African elites to trade, not necessarily for slaves, but slaves among other items, especially gold, okay? And that's in the 1640s. Cormonti first appeared as an ethnonym, okay, as referring to a people um, in a pamphlet describing the Barbados Rebellion of 1680. Okay? It appears in other places as well, but that's when it begins, begins to be used, the late 17th century, to be used as an ethnonym to describe Akan peoples okay, from the Gold Coast. Okay? In this early period, I think the English are simply lumping together all Africans from the Gold Coast and calling them Coromantes. In the 1720s, however, okay, and I'm getting this from the Afri from a Ghanaian historian named um, John Kofi Finn, okay. Um, in the 1720s, Asante began to emerge as the dominant power in this region, okay, that generated so many slaves that came to Jamaica, okay. And um, Opokuwari, who was then the, the emperor of Asante, the king of Asante, established the Great Oath of Asante, which made reference to Cormantine okay, as the place where his predecessor had fallen in battle. Okay? And that gave the, the word Cormantine greater power among the Aka, okay, who are shaped by the rise of Asante, which is a, a lot of people. Okay? And many of many of Akin are, are the slave trade is continuing, okay. But now in the 1720s, 1730s, you have the arrival of people for whom the word Coromanti means something, okay, in their own cultural understandings of the world, okay. And here in the Americas, okay, the, the planters are calling them Coromanti, okay. And I think there's a transition here, okay from uh, of the word Coromanti, of the way that it worked. I think it becomes a political identity. And I think this is a process of coalescence, right? And I borrow that, 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 that concept from the Native American historiography, where they talk about the emergence of new tribes, okay, in the context of settler colonialism, right? 
in the 17th and 18th century. I think a similar process is happening within the slave societies of the Americas. Okay, so I don't think you had to be Akin or from the Gold Coast to take on that Coromante identity. And I don't think that if you were Akin, you necessarily identified with the slave rebel. Okay, and I think this explains a lot of things. Like we can't really nail down whether a Pongo was Coromante or not, as Vince spoke of earlier, and as he wrote about eloquently in his book. Um, so I just want to leave it there really with um, provocation for further discussion about um, the place of Tacky's Revolt within Jamaican history and um, the role of the Coromante and what that means, what we mean by that. And I'll cede my time to whoever's following me. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ujima. That's um, excellent timekeeping on part of both our speakers so far. Um, the questions are starting to come in through the question panel. So just a reminder that if you do want to address questions to the, uh, the speakers, then use the question panel to, to submit them and we will uh, save them up uh, for after everyone has spoken. Uh, but I'll move now to our third speaker who is Professor Lisa Bolatino. Uh, she is Associate Professor of History at Framingham State University. Uh, and she has a new book coming out very soon, uh, Slavery, War and Britain's 18th Century Atlantic Empire. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank you um, also to Trevor for organizing this panel. And thank you to the staff of the Wilberforce Institute who are working very hard in the background to make this webinar work. Um, so I want to talk today about how I came to offer a narrative of Tacky's revolt that differed from those who preceded me, from historians who preceded me. And I hope really to be talking to those of you in the audience who are not professional historians and um, shed some insight into how historians go about constructing narratives and what this means. Um, so this might also help you to understand what we gain from having so many scholars um, in this panel. So you're not gonna get a start to finish narrative of Tacky's revolt. We're not gonna be able to go into the detail that we might um, uh, if you only had one speaker. But what I think you will get insight into is the fact that different historians bring different questions to bear on the past and offer really different insights into events and you're going to be getting that from all of these historians who are speaking to you today. So when I came to study Tacky's Revolt, I did so as part of a larger inquiry into um, the ways in which enslaved and free people of African descent made use of um, the context of imperial warfare to wield military and political authority in the British Atlantic world. And when I first started writing, I largely um, was focused on the Seven Years' War, which Vincent mentioned um, was a, a war that pitted Britain against France and later Spain as well in Europe, in the Americas, um, in Africa, in Asia. And um, so between 1756 and 1763. So historians had come to see the Seven Years' War as a really important moment for the formation of identity of indigenous peoples and British colonial peoples in mainland North America. And when I first started writing, I was really interested in what this war meant for people of African descent because really no one had written about that. And so that's what I set out to do. And so I read all sorts of sources about the Atlantic world um, in order to figure this out. So I read military records, the records of military leaders, um, their correspondence, their accounts, their order books, their logs, their muster rolls. Um, I read political records, the correspondence of colonial officials, um, their reports, their course, et cetera. Um, I read the accounts and the correspondence of civilians to find out what ordinary people were experiencing. Um, and I read 
British and British North American newspapers, um, published accounts of the war, uh, dur both during the war and in its aftermath. And so in reading all of these, I recognized pretty quickly um, that Tacky's Revolt was seen as a battle of the Seven Years' War by contemporaries. Um, there were I, there were accounts of uh, the siege of Havana. There were accounts of the British conquest of Martinique and Guadeloupe. So all these took place around the same period in the early 1760s. And tacky, reports of Tacky's revolt were alongside reports of these battles um, in newspapers and in correspondence. And so I knew that it was seen by contemporaries as a battle of the Seven Years' War. And so I set out to understand, just as I was ex exploring what happened in Martinique, what, I, what happened in Guadeloupe, what happened in Havana, I set out to explore what happened in Jamaica in the early 1760s and the ways in which enslaved and free people wielded violence um, both in opposition to the colonial order and in support of it. And so because um, I was really focused on that context of imperial warfare, the narrative of Tacky's revolt that I offered was really different than the ones that had preceded mine. So when historians had written about Tacky's revolt before me, they had largely been interested in the identity and the identities of and objectives of the rebels. So who instigated this revolt and for what purposes? And I had found that largely the story that they were telling was a story of an ethnic rebellion perpetrated by a con slaves um, and a unified one that began in St. Mary's perish under the leadership of Tacky and then radiated throughout the island, um, but one that had been a preconcerted, pre-planned revolt. And because I was attuned to the con context of the Seven Years' War and the panic that slaveholders felt at being simultaneously beset by internal enemies um, in the four of their in those they held in bondage, and enemies from without, the French who they daily expected to um, invade from Saint-Domingue in reprisal for the taking of Guadeloupe, um, they, I, I knew how panicked they were. And this is just very clear in the sources, they were super panicked. And so I read with some degree of skepticism their unearthing of conspiracies on the part of the enslaved throughout Jamaica. Um, so obviously, this rebellion or series of rebellions involved many people, many enslaved people actually wielding violence um, in many parishes throughout the island. This is without a question. But I wasn't sure that every conspiracy in every parish that was unearthed by panicked slaveholders actually had been a, a, a plan to revolt. And I also wasn't sure that the narrative that slaveholders um, evolved to make sense of, to make intelligible the revolt while they were experiencing it, that of a unified rebellion on the part of their Coromonte slaves was actually what happened. Um, so I went in with that question. I wasn't actually convinced of it. And, um, so what I ended up arguing was that Jamaica did not experience a single rebellion during the early 1760s, that in fact, they experienced a series of rebellions. Um, and as, so the enslaved people of St. Mary's Parish revolted, or a core, a core of them did, and then, enslaved people throughout the island took advantage of the slaveholders' panic and the dispersal of defensive forces throughout the island to att attend to all of those you know, possible conspiracies to revolt. Um, it's not that I don't 
I mean, I do believe that Coromanti affiliations, religious, um, ethnic, political, military affiliations that preceded the arrival of enslaved people in Jamaica and that evolved through their tenure in Jamaica certainly shaped why they were doing what they were doing. Um, but I but I was really very concerned with this context of war and how it enabled them to do what they wanted to do at that particular moment. I was also interested in um, not only those who rebelled, but those enslaved and free people of African descent who chose to wield violence on behalf of the colonial order. Um, those who, like the Maroons, um, like the black and brown militia, um, like the enslaved people who were armed by planters to defend plantations, um, why they chose to do what they do, what they did, um, and how the colony came to envision their military service in the wake of the revolt. So I will leave it there um, and look forward to our later discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, moving on now to our fourth speaker, uh, which is Robert Hansard. Uh, Robert Hansard is Assistant Professor of History at Columbia College in Chicago. Uh, and Professor Hansard is the author of Identity, Spirit and Freedom in the Atlantic World, the Gold Coast and the African Diaspora. So over to you, Robert. Thank you. Yeah, uh, hi, and uh, also thanks too for inviting me and organizing this, Trevor, and um, it's an honor to also participate um, in, in this conversation around a very important uh, historical event. Um, so the things I'm gonna look at are some of the limitations around some of the contemporary sources, the Long, Edwards, and Thistlewoods, uh, um, as well as uh, the Code and War, and then also maybe just explore a little bit the viability of these sort of interdisciplinary West African uh, evidences. Um, regarding the former, the Cold War, uh, Long, Edwards, and Thistlewood, um, I think uh, if you think about them, um, they offer these sort of nuanced reimaginings, uh, but are particularly sort of partial towards uh, the plantocracy, towards slavery, and certainly towards negative depictions of the African and Afro-Atlantic culture and identity. Um, and so if you look at Long, Long is a wealthy um, slave owner from St. Anne, member of the Jamaican Assembly, friend of the governor. Um, his tacky is uh, a Comratine hero of a black affair, handsome, young, and of good stature, well-made, um, becomes a leader because he resembles somebody in Africa. Um, in fact, there's a bronze statue um, that uh, he has a likeness to, likeness to um, and uh, but not necessarily because of any sort of military skill. Um, Brian Edwards, uh, who also uh, happens to be a significant landowner. Um, in fact, uh, right around St. Mary's Parish, uh, um, he's present on some of those lands um, owned by the Bailey family. Um, Pro-slavery politician in Jamaica and in England. Um, uh, as, his youth, as a youth, he was with his uncle, Zachary Bailey, uh, Bailey uh, as the uh, re uh, rebellion sort of commenced in, seven, in the 1760s. Um, he wrote poetry um, as, a, as a child uh, that reflected on um, different sort of meanings. Uh, for the slave rebels, they were tragic uh, heroes. Alternative to, alternatively, the Maroons were considered deficient in virtue and true courage, right? Um, and in fact, he accounts that they roasted and actually devoured the uh, hearts and entrails of Tacky once he was captured by these Maroons, right? Um, Thistlewood, uh, from a different viewpoint. I mean, um, he's not as wealthy as uh, Edwards or Long, small scale rancher and overseer, um, but it gives us some very um, important insights on these events, especially that he's reporting from um, um, Southwest Westmoreland, uh, a parish on way on the opposite side of the island. Um, and um, he starts hearing about this supposed rebe rebellion that's gonna involve 3000 men and that it's gonna take place sometime in uh, late uh, May, 1760. Um, sitting with one of his colleagues they have a conversation and they recall that some strange guy comes to him in the mountains and also again uh warns of this uh coming rebellion um and within a very short time you know uh this would will awaken to the, the murder and the chaos of this of this uh these events um 
again, he but he depends on trusted slaves. Um, he witnesses firsthand Maroon efforts to capture runaways. Um, but still, again, you have someone who's very much a, a rancher, an overseer, and, and, and invested in this, um, you know, the, the maintenance of the slave system. Uh, and then the Code and War, um, which is, uh, you know, a several series of laws. Um, the ones I'm, I'm sort of focusing on are 1761, but certainly to the, as things uh, coalesce around the major, uh, you know, legislation of 1788. Um, but just the sort of restrictions um, in the context of the rebellion, right? Uh, no possession of arms and ammunition. Uh, uh, you have to register in vestry books. Um, the beating on drums, the blowing of horns, and any kinds of instruments are strictly forbidden because of the fatal consequences that they can bring. Um, because essentially um, that they were concerned that uh, these were being used as signals as a way to, uh, con to, to, to communicate the ideas of rebellion. Um, um, people who were leaving the plantation have to have a pass. Um, but I'll draw it on the Obe uh, and the depiction of Obe just a little bit, right? Um, which uh, again, uh, they stipulated that um, anyone who had pretend supernatural power, anyone who was attempting to poison or use a poisonous drug um, will suffer death or hard life, right? Um, so together, taken together, these things do provide some insights. I mean, this is, you need these sources to, to attempt to make sense of, of what has happened during this period. Uh, um, but ultimately you leave with a sort of strange depiction of these folks. So like others have sort of mentioned, the importance of the African evidence just becomes very, very clear. At the very least, if we say we wanna know maybe uh, who this tacky figure is, and this is named about it, and, and, and certainly the others like Apongo and, and, um, are also equally relevant. Um, but, uh, what, you know, what's the nature of this, this choice of this tacky and also some degree, uh, um, some look at some of the spirituality. And for me, the interdisciplinary, the interdisciplinary evidence from Africa is helpful in, in that regard, right? Um, it, it's a counterpoint perhaps to the sort of uh, understandings of African spirituality and American environs as uh, malevolent or as uh, resistant to uh, slavery. Um, so what kind of evidence and how maybe to, how do you go about sort of doing this look, right? Well, uh, a historian who influenced me, um, James Nkwanda, um, who I got to actually meet, um, very older, elder statesman historian. I got to sit and talk with him some, and, and he gave me a whole bunch of stuff to read uh, as I was working on my uh, dissertation during that time. But uh, he, uh, one of the things I looked at was this eclectic approach, a survey of data available to other disciplines and selective application for practical conclusions and contributions to discipline. And so for me, that opened up the need to consider oral evidence, ethnographic evidence, archival evidence, archeological evidence, even to some degree, uh, um, some understanding of aesthetics or arts and, and visual imagery uh, uh, and, and the sort of importance of that uh, uh, and, and as a way to music, as a way to make meaning of these sort of historical postures. And, and, and that certainly is what we, we are dealing with if we're attempting to sort of make sense of some of the meaning of this revolt from the sort of African uh, side. Um, so I, I tried to sort of nail down this name Tacky. I wanted to know, you know, you know, know where did he sort of show in history? Um, just the name. No, I, I didn't expect to find, um, you know, this Tacky rebel born in the Gold Coast and, and, and arriving to the Americas, but just the name itself. Um, did it show up in the historical record at all? And, and certainly, and, and this stuff sort of maybe creates this sort of historical uh, bookends on, on one hand, uh, the end of the uh, 17th century, on the other hand, uh, somewhere in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, Bossman, uh, Wilhelm Bossman's account, a new and accurate description of the coast of Guinea, um, who will make reference to uh, two Akan uh, chiefs who have the name Taki. Uh, then there are um, some uh, correspondence by uh, an employee of the Royal Africa Company, David Harper in 1683, um, who again um, will um, make reference to this name Taki. Um, and so there, there we are, we have two archival sources on the Africa side that are making and pointing to some evidences. Another piece I thought that was very helpful um, was um, just correlating the name. Um, and in and, and my investigation uh, of the name Taki, I found that it had both sort of, of uh, origins on the Ga side, the Ga Dangbi, or primarily the Ga people, but also with the Akan people as well, right? Um, and amongst the Akan, you have uh, this name Taki showing up as uh, members of a royal house. They served as an ohene or a chief, um, the mouthpiece of the chief um, as military leaders. Um, and, um, 
in and around the state of little and great states of little and great Comenda in the Western Gold Coast, right? Um, and this was a state that had connections to the Fante de Vinchira, the Ashanti, and these other groups, right? These are also um, certainly the groups that are well known at the European forests of El Mina, Cape Coast, Anamabu, and Comrati as well, right? Um, so, and, and, and so amid uh, sort of emerging conflict in the 1680s, um, the king's brother, Teki Akan, and the king himself, Abu Teki, uh, um, are in this sort of conflict uh, with uh, the Dutch. Um, and um, so I just thought that was quite interesting that that name would show up there. Um, so, so I said, hmm. And, and then maybe on the other side, into the 19th century, um, uh, amongst the Ga, um, certainly the name Taki represented um, these early folks um, who actually were coming um, as uh, members of, uh, as Akan merchants who were fishermen and other things. They've been coming since the 16th century and had interactive relationships with the Akan people. Um, and so that way uh, um, we have this sort of presence of the Akan. But then even on the Ga side, um, we see the name Taki Kome as representative of a 19th century uh, a Ga monster, Ga chief, who assumes uh, political and spiritual authority in the 19th century. So these are these sort of bookends where I see this name Taki coming up. And, and, and it's sure to suggest the plausibility of these sorts of events and these histories being influential um, to um, this name Tacky. Um, and, and, and as well, it works as a nice counterpoint or complementary piece of evidence to use alongside with Long, Edwards, Thistlewood, the Code and the War, and, and other archival sources. Trevor, but sorry, I think I was muted just then. Um, our final speaker now, uh, we're moving to Professor Trevor Bernard from uh, the Wilberforce Institute. Um, Trevor is the Wilberforce Professor of Slavery and Emancipation here at the University of Hull. Uh, he's the author of many works, uh, but most recently, Jamaica in the Age of Revolution. Uh, so over to you, Trevor. Well, thank you very much. and um honoured to have uh, to, to be following uh, such a distinguished group of historians. It's a great delight for me that uh, that, that, uh, that, that everyone decided to join. Um, Tacky's Revolt, or, or Wages War, uh, was the most significant war by non-white people in the British Empire before the Sepoy Mutiny in, in 1857 uh, and the New Zealand Wars in the 1860s. And at a time when we, should be, we are rethinking who from Britain's imperial past should be recognised and commemorated, uh, we do well to acknowledge the victims of Jamaican slavery in this especially bloody imperial episode. My career has been mostly studying the perpetrators uh, rather than the victims of Tacky's War. I came to the revolt primarily through a close study of the diaries of Thomas Thistlewood, who left the, major, the only major eyewitness account of the rebellion that I know of. I studied these planters and the power they exercised over enslaved people, partly to understand them and the culture they helped create in Jamaica, but also to appreciate what enslaved people were up against when they rebelled. What the enslaved people who rose up against slavery in Jamaica in 1760 faced were determined foes and overwhelmingly negative odds. That they did what they did, knowing the grisly fate that was likely to meet them if they failed, and slave rebellions almost always failed, showed immense courage. And we should celebrate that heroism in ways that we celebrate the heroism of other British heroes uh, fighting for freedom against powerful enemies. Well, the consequences of Tacky Revolt were clear if contradictory. It forced the imperial state to take security seriously. Uh, it changed irrevo irrevocably uh, the nature of Jamaican society. But the success of Governor Henry Moore's forceful conduct in the revolt and the fierce repression that followed uh, showed to white Jamaicans that as long as they were determined on a rapid and tyrannical response uh, at the merest hint of rebellion, they could keep themselves safe. On the other hand, this brutal, if effective response elicited horror in Britain. How could their fellow countrymen uh, act towards others in such an appalling way? As Vincent Brown has argued, rebels were seen in Britain as Christian martyrs, even though they were unlikely to be Christian. It may have indeed provided an impetus for the fledgling abolitionist movement to grow, one deeply inflected by ideas of Christian sacrifice. The terror of whites in 1760, uh, as, as Lisa, Lisa has pointed out, was so great that the Jamaican state acted very strangely towards rebels. 
As Jason Sharples argues, the state was normally obsessed about finding out the causes of any slave conspiracy. So they interrogated, they tortured, and they killed in order to get information. But that did not happen here. The Jamaican state concentrated instead on gruesome displays of revenge. They focused in short on killing rebels rather than trying to understand them. Slave rebellions usually ended because people blabbed to save their skin. This didn't happen here. It takes a lot of detective work, as my brilliant colleagues here have shown, uh, to find out what truly happened in 1759 and 1760 before the events of April, May 1760. And I can't stress strongly enough that although I have a slightly different take on the causes of a revolt than my fellow panelists, uh, I tend to put more emphasis on the structure of plantation history uh, than on, on perhaps on, on, on Africa. Uh, there are so few sources in relation, or so few good sources in relationship to Taki's revolt, that it's perfectly possible for there to be several plausible interpretations of the causes, course, and consequences of Taki's revolt. I've no desire to quarrel with my fellow, fellow panelists because it's perfectly possible that my interpretation is wrong and what everybody else says is absolutely correct. Uh, it's probably true, actually. We just don't know. In, in short, I can see very much the force of arguments made in support of Taki's revolt being a Gold Coast-led rebellion, even if I would stress other factors. I've learned a great deal from scholars who have studied the Gold Coast diaspora in the Americas. And one thing I appreciate now is the arguments made by several historians uh, that we need to adopt, a, a, need to adopt um, a wider perspective of what the term Coromantee actually means. Walter Rucker, for example, argues that Coromantee should not be understood as solely a reference to a Khan speakers born in the Gold Coast. He usefully notes how Coromantee is expressed in an idea of a certain kind of martial character. Vincent talks about this as much about masculine toughness as being an ethno-linguistic or regional identifier, which is what Edward's also talking about as well. Rucker compare, compares intriguingly Coromantee to the term Spartan, which refers not just to people from a, spa, from, from a space, but to an idea of a soldier and a people who are self-disciplined, austere, courageous, and authoritarian. Uh, it's very easy to see Wager as Spartan uh, if Coromante signified in Jamaica what Spartan did in ancient Greece. Well, I could talk a little bit about um, Edward Long, but I just want to say that, that, that in my work, I've tended to favour the interpretation of why the slave revolts in Westmoreland occurred uh, that was advanced by Thomas Thistlewood, perhaps because I've written a book about him, so I'm biased in his favour. Thistlewood noted the Coromante aspects of the uprisings, but downplayed them in what I would call in favour of what I call plantation solidarity. One important feature of the revolt was that it was conducted almost entirely by enslaved people working on sugar estates, plantation workers. The centre of the rebellion in Westmoreland was an Arkham Forest Maze Muir estate, a state which was also a hotbed of, of enslaved unrest in an aborted slave rebellion in 1765. What united these, these rebels together uh, was that they had a plantation experience, an experience of being treated with brutal contempt by a series of vicious overseers uh, where they suffered ill health and an early death due to the rigours of working uh, in sugar uh, cultivation. In short, Forest Estate was a hotbed of rebellion. And I think in part it was a hotbed of rebellion because of the particular ways uh, in which, which, which enslaved people joined together on that, on that plantation. And in fact, one of the things I'd like to know a lot more about is what was happened on that particular plantation. Because uh, I have a feeling it was the, the conditions on slavery on this large sugar estate uh, that lit the fuse for rebellion, at least in Westmoreland Parish. If what made enslaved people rebel was that they were plantation slaves, what was it about the 18th, mid 18th century plantation that encouraged enslaved people to join together in rebellion in ways they did not do before? Well, what I would like to argue, and I guess here I'm, I'm, I'm following what Edward was, was saying in term, and, and also what Lisa's saying in terms of uh, paying attention to Jamaica in this particular period, is that I think 1750s was a very fraught period uh, in this period, uh, in, in this time. Governor Edward Trelawney in the 1740s warned his fellow countrymen that they were playing with edge tools, their rage for buying Negroes and a mere careless slave management. They seem to be, Charles Leslie argued, the cruelest slave masters in the world. What, I, and I think Trelawney and Leslie were right. What pushed enslaved people into rebellion was the nature of the plantation system and the collective unity that developed uh, on plantations 
among enslaved people of very heterogeneous origins. And I'll just mention very briefly a, a couple of things about the plantation, which I think we need to take into account when thinking about Tacky's rebellion. The first thing I think is, is something which which is obvious but is, is worth it re-emphasizing is that a, a, a slave plantation, a sugar estate, had enslaved Africans from a wide variety of different African groups. Uh, the Jamaican plantation, contrary to what planters argued, was a place of great diversity, where what united people, enslaved people together was their current common experience as workers in the harsh regime of sugar. Second, the plantation system changed over time. And what is noticeable, I think, is that the plantation system that we know about, the large sugar estate with hundreds of enslaved workers, a small but vulnerable cadre of white managers and indifferent owners whose main, main ambition was to get as much money out of their enslaved workers as possible, came about only in the 1720s in settled areas and only in the frontier areas like St. Mary and in, in West Moreland in the 1740s. The rebellions occurred in places where the plantation system had only recently been put in place, where customs governing master-server interactions had not yet developed, and where profit maximization dominated every other planter consideration. These were its places of extreme cruelty and bad treatment. The 1750s was a terrible time uh, to be an enslaved person. Many of the people who suffered in this period were Africans from the Gold Coast. And it's, it's something that Vincent's pointed out, uh, which is that large Jamaica received a large number of people from the Gold Coast in the slave trade in the 1740s, moving out to the frontier areas of Westmoreland. Well, the harshness of slavery at this time, time may have contributed to Gold Coast and slave people being seen by planters as very good workers and extremely troublesome people. It may have also have made them prone to rebelliousness rebelliousness which may not have just come from their African experience, but also because they were the first Africans in, in, in Western Jamaica uh, to experience the traumas of working under the plantation machine that was a large sugar estate. I'd also like to emphasize another feature which I think Orlando Patterson has been drawing out uh, in a recent book uh, on, on why, why Jamaica over the long period is different from Barbados. And that is, as, as Patterson says, is that Jamaica always had weak institutions compared with places like Barbados. And it's noticeable that Barbados has no slave revolt uh, in the 18th century. Jamaicans were left very much on their own in the 1750s. Managers of enslaved people, usually callow men on the make who were Im English immigrants like Thomas Thistlewood, were left mostly on their own to deal with angry, resentful enslaved people, many of whom, as my fellow panelists have shown, had considerable military experience in Africa. The state gave little help. Uh, and and, and Thistlewood, if you look at his diaries, uh, where he was had, had to involve, employ to dreadful violence in the 1750s, uh, did so very much on his own. He was violent towards enslaved people who were, who were, who, who were pretty violent back to him uh, without much support from the state. To an extent, he, he got the support of enslaved people at times, by providing them with some protection against raids on their land and property from, from enslaved people from other plantations. Uh, there was, as, as Edward has pointed out, uh, a, a form of war uh, in, in Jamaica, and that war often involved enslaved people against other enslaved people. But that support for planters was highly conditional. In general, enslaved people hated whites, and when they had a chance, they rose up against them. My bet is that enslaved people had had enough of their continual mistreatment in the 1750s, years of great profits in the plantation economy, but also years of war, also years of droughts, also years of food shortages, and periods where the institutional structure was so weak uh, that it made it seem that white people were very vulnerable. I would have thought an experienced warrior such as a Congo would have seen how precarious white authority was on the plantation and might have thought that rebellion was possible. Well, this, is, of course, is speculation, as is most things to do with Tacky's revolt. But what I want to suggest, I guess, to conclude is that we can find the roots of the slave rebellions in Jamaica in 1760 as much in the nature of a Jamaican plantation system and in Jamaica itself as we can see it in the larger Atlantic world, even though I take very much the points that other column, my other commentators have made about the Atlantic dimensions of this particular revolt. The plantation system was in great trouble I believe, in the late 1750s. Apongo tried to increase its troubles uh, and he nearly succeeded. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Trevor. Um, so we're going to move now to the commentator uh, who has quite a, a challenging job, I think, um, uh, particularly because I don't think she's received these papers in advance. But anyway, um, uh, commentator is Professor Erica Charters, who is Associate Professor of Global History and History of Medicine at the University of Oxford. And she is also the author of Disease, War and the Imperial State, the welfare of British Armed Forces during the Seven Years' War. So um, if you want to speak for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll be able to move to the questions. So thanks, Erica. OK, um, thanks. And fear not, I actually want to speak very briefly, because what I'm really looking forward to are the questions and responses on top of this. So what I want to first of all note is just this wonderful array of summaries and also a wonderful display of the range of analytical and historical approaches really moving from one event from Taki's revolt in 1760 to painting such a broad historical picture. And so what I'm going to do here is just pick out a few themes uh, to encourage further reflection and questions. One theme is the identity of Taki, of Apongo. This is something that we often return to, even as we note, we will never know for certain. And I think this also mixes in with broader questions about the meaning and the use of terms such as Coromanti, as Edward and Trevor outlined. But this question seems not so much about what we can ascertain, but instead how we make sense of, so how we humanize, how we access as historians the lives of enslaved people, even the plantation complex itself. So how we conceptualize the movement of cultural and spiritual practices across the Atlantic, who composes these worlds. And so to, to go beyond numbers and to go beyond structures, and so also to think about how our narratives and our findings are shaped by our historical approaches and fundamentally by our sources, as Robert points out. Tied to this is the other conceptual theme that I think each of our speakers examines in different ways. And this can be summarized as defining, if not rethinking, war and resistance. So rather than focusing simply on uprisings or on rebellions, what happens when we think more rigorously, but also I think more imaginatively about the category of war, where it gets applied and by whom. I'm thinking here of Vincent Brown's concept of a war within a network of wars. And as Vincent wrote in his book, his call uh, for historians to rethink how they too often see war as an aberration, instead of seeing a continuous state of war as underpinning the Atlantic empires in this period, as well as perhaps underpinning slavery as an institution. Likewise, the research of Lissa and Robert also pushes us to think about how those at the time, writers such as Edward Long, continue to shape historical narratives that contain fundamental assumptions as to how we define resistance and war, as well as change and continuity in the historical record. This, of course, is also a question about how we incorporate slavery into our own historical narratives, whether for teaching or for research, and not just about its inclusion, but at what point, at what juncture in our histories, and from which perspective, and whether we can capture the range and variety of plantation slavery's practices and trauma, as Trevor encourages us to do. So my final point is simply to highlight the invigorating nature of having five different perspectives on one event. And even to note here the, uh, the usefulness of historical disagreement, right? The range of interpretations on display here is evidence of the sophistication of this historical topic and research. But I think it's also important as we come together, as we're thinking about how to shape and how to reshape historical narratives, not just for academics, but for a broader audience. And what we can see here is the vibrancy contained within the history of one event when it is interpreted from a variety of perspectives and understood within its context of empire, of slavery, of war, and of a wide ranging but unstable Atlantic world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erica. Um, great job of um, summarizing a lot of complicated uh, material and drawing some really interesting threads. Um, are we going to now bring back all the speakers' cameras 
um, I think the people there are people behind the scenes, Judith and Nick, who are uh, in controlling things. So hopefully you can now see uh, all of the speakers on your screen. And we have uh, quite a number of questions already, um, but pretty, please do um, send send more, uh, and I will uh, read them out and direct them to the to uh, to our panel. Um, so I think we're going to begin uh, by a question from uh, Ron Belgrave, which I think was sent while um, uh, Professor Brown was was talking, but actually is um, equally uh, well uh, directed to Professor Hansard. So maybe you can both have a, a stab at it. Um, Ron Belgrave asks, uh, many Jamaicans are of Ghanaian ancestry and Taki is a common Ghanaian or Akan name. Uh, was this name erroneously recorded by the slave masters as Taki, and was this man more likely to be called Taki? Uh, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing the, the Akan name there. Um, so, Vince, do you want to go first with that question? Yeah, I mean, very briefly before I hand it off to Professor Hansen to kind of, you know, to take us into the etymology. But yeah, what you find in these, you know, British transcriptions of names is all kinds of mistakes. Um, they're basically doing it phonically, it's whatever they hear with their untrained ears and they're writing down what they think they hear and they're misspelling and then somebody else interprets that. So when one's going through, I mean, they'll, they'll write the same name four, five, six different ways, especially when you get to these, the, the records of the, of the castle forts. So um, certainly the way that they decide tacky, techie, techie ought to be written and then the way it's said after that is is rarely going to be exactly you know how it would have sounded or how it would have been written um, among Gold Coast native speakers. So I'll hand it off to Professor Hanser to take us more into how that would have worked out. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would totally agree with that, and I would just use that as an example, something I referenced in my talk, which was a uh, uh, um, a Bossman's piece, and when he talks about tacky <laughs> on the same page, he spells it two different ways. So there's Taki Akan, T-A-K-I-A-N-K-A-N. We know that's, you know, Akan, uh, Akan. Uh, and then um, Ab Abu Taki, A-B-E-T-E-K-C-K-E-Y. So those are just two from that source. And then if you start going into some of the others, you got Tete with a T and a E-T-T-H-I and all these other different versions. And that's why it, it kind of, I got lost because I, I I think initially I said it was a Ka or a Ga name because the first I heard of it was from a Ga connection um, at the Ga Royal House talking to two chiefs and they were saying no this is Ga this has a it's it's a name that has this Ga connection then I went and said that and I think I was talking to an Akan story and he was like that's a Ka that's an Akan name and I was like oh. so <laughs> but then as I looked I was like no that that's correct so but yeah there's a lot of fluidity there sure. Can I, say, can I add something to that? Can yes, I add something very briefly to that? Which is why kind of the way I conceive that in the book is that the name really is an indicator of a process. And it's the process of transformation that we ought to be trying to understand. Mm -hmm. Pinning down the exact name for me, you know, we could talk about how one would do it, how one gets there. But to me, again, the more important thing is the process that's revealed in trying to track those things down. And the same is with, with Wager Opongo in his biography. It was more important to me at the end of the day to know that he had some kind of experiences that he might have shared with other Africans caught up in the world of slavery and warfare that he would have brought to Jamaica, right? That was far more important to me ultimately than having a singular biography for that character. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to other questions because there are a lot coming in and if I give every panelist the chance to respond to every question we will only cover a, a very few so I, I hope that's um okay um so this question is from douglas hamilton and i think it's primarily for professor rujima um he asks given the later aftershocks in quotation marks of taki's revolt throughout the eight, the 1760s and your call Professor Rujima for a wider focus. Is it useful to think of Taki's revolt as a spike in long emancipation struggles by the enslaved rather than a self-contained event? Um, and maybe some other people might want to come in on that one as well, but I'll start with you, Professor Edward Rujima. You're there. 
Yes, uh, sure. You could you could certainly see it that way, um, and I think that's what Lissa was pointing to in terms of seeing this period as a, as a series of revolts, um, rather than one single uh, rebellion, one single organized rebellion. I don't think I don't think we know for sure. Um, they're they're all they're all happening at the same time, and they're all happening within this window. And I think what's happening in Africa is very important in terms of the ex, of the of the capture and export of people with military experience and the, the the arrival of those people into Jamaican society the the severe oppression of the plantation regime at that time okay and their willingness to use their military skills to re, to, to revolt against them i mean that process characterizes Jamaican history from say the from much of the 18th century, really, but especially the 18th century up until, say, 1770, 1760, 1765, 1770. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in on that question? Because it's quite I'll a broad one. Lisa, in, yeah, come in. Yeah, I'll jump in quickly to say that I think what that question is also asking is um, about what enslaved people knew of what was happening in Jamaica and um, what inspiration may they have taken from it. And we know from the work of multiple historians that enslaved people were bound in a network of communication throughout the Atlantic. And mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. fairly mm -hmm. clear that enslaved people throughout the Atlantic would have known what was happening in Jamaica and would have used it um, to their own purposes wherever they were and would have been inspired and fueled by it. And so to see what happened in Jamaica in the early 1760s, we can see what happened in Jamaica in the early 1760s as a series of rebellions, but also it served to perhaps give rise to or lay the groundwork for or inspire other rebellions elsewhere. And Vince talks about this in his work as well, if you want to talk, Vince. Yeah, I think just very briefly, it's worth also acknowledging that Sir Hilary Beckles, in a short review essay in the early 1980s, uh, wrote about slave resistance as a 200 years war. Right? So for him, it was not any, none of these were events, it were all battles within a much longer war. And Vereen Shepherd has, has also argued something similar in her work. So um, we're not starting fresh right here. Can I just add that, that, that one of the things that I think is, is uh, significant here is that, uh, and, and this comes to what Erica was saying in terms of uh, historical narratives, is that we always have the danger of teleological thinking. And, and I, I'm sure that that, that, that there would be a criticism that you could lay against my, my particular paper, is that because an event happened, we look at the causes of it and we explain, cause, we explain those particular causes and say, well, therefore it's likely to have occurred because of those particular causes. But it is interesting, I think, Jamaica seems to be a, 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 a place that in the 18th century was more rebellious than most other slave colonies. And there seems to be obvious reasons why that might occur. But there are also periods, and, and, and this is interesting in relationship to what, what, what Ed's been talking about, there are also periods like the 1730s, the Maroon War, the late, the early 1710s and 1720s are periods of great transformation where there were not slave rebellions. So in some ways, why slave rebellions don't occur when there are, when, when all the conditions are propitious for it, it can be just as interesting as why slave rebellions do occur when also conditions are propitious. Uh, if I could just say one thing, I think it's just interesting how when, um, you know, uh, people can run away <laughs> to the Maroons, that that might have been one of the best ways to uh, uh, sort of articulate uh, self-liberation ethos um, to get away. Um, so there, there, you know, there, there could be something there. I, I mean, I, I agree. I, you have to be careful. The teleology can get you in a bad place because you you you'll want it to say, "Well, oh, this is this," and then you 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 can find yourself misreading it in, in the context or trying to affix everything to that sort of a narrative. And you have to be extremely careful of that when, you, when you're trying to tell a sort of a perception of history. But I, I mean, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe there is a catalyst. Maybe people do take it. I mean, we know people take oaks in Africa over long periods of time and, and keep them and hold them and manifest them in not just in the Americas, in Africa and in, in a range of different situations. So so it could or it couldn't. <laughs> I mean, and whatever historical narrative that we retell today maybe has to sort of 
sit in that space. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in about uh, women and gender, so maybe I'm going to package them together for you, and they, I think, are directed not to any particular member of the panel. So um, Tracy O'Brien asks, how do you contend with uncovering narratives about women in the limited evidence here? Um, and Clifton Sorrell uh, asks um, a more specific question, how do we get at gender and the lives of enslaved women such as Cubba, the Queen of Kingston within the context of this revolt? Uh, seems her narrative is reflective of her archival presence, uh, which is much fragmented and receives very little attention behind the masking of a masculinized uprising. So how might we understand the gender dimension in the African context of Taki's revolt? Uh, who would like to uh, have a go at answering that one first? Um, I'm not sure who's best placed to to come in there. Anyone want to jump in? I can talk um, about a source that I found that was that was incredibly interesting to me, which is that uh, anytime you know you had these rebellions, because kind of the militia were so outnumbered. Uh, in Jamaica, they would depend on Royal Navy warships often to take anybody that the militia had captured and put them aboard a warship, right, while they went back in to, to, fight, to fight the rebellion. And so after that first phase of rebellion in the parish of St. Mary, right, you have 25 rebels captured and they're put aboard a Royal Navy warship. And because the Royal Navy is, a, is, a, is a, an assiduous bureaucracy, they record the names of all of those rebels, of those 25 rebels captured. Of the first 25 rebels captured in Tacky's Revolt in the parish of St. Mary, about 40% of those are women. Ten of those names are women's mm -hmm. names, identify women's names. So we don't exactly know what they were doing in the context of that revolt. But what we can say is that if 40% of the first rebels captured, and that's about um, their percentage of the population in the parish, um, they, were, they were certainly engaged at the very outset of the revolt in some way. And I think at least that raises a question about what women were doing in this revolt that um, causes us to, to, to move away from this idea that women were doing something radically different than men, that they would have just been playing domestic roles and not uh, principally engaged in the fighting. And so that gives us another context to think about Cuba, the Queen of Kingston, right? When we go to study her case, which is not well known, of course, but one thing we do know is that she was able to prevail upon a ship captain to drop her off on the island when she was supposed to be exiled. I spent a lot of time looking at maps of the island and trying to plot exactly where things happened moment by moment in the course of this revolt. And where that ship captain dropped her off was just on the, side, the other side of the Hanover Mountains from the main rebels barricade in the parish of Westmoreland. So again, I can't tell you much about that, but I can tell you that she had herself dropped off very close to where this main rebel base was in Westmoreland Parish. We can't be speculate that she was aware of what was happening and had herself dropped off there perhaps to rejoin the fight. I can't prove it, but I can raise that question. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to come in on this question about gender and women? Well, I, I, I guess I, I, hes I hesitate to answer because um, uh, it, it's it's something which has always puzzled me, and I don't have a good answer to it. So, but I, I do wonder whether you might. It, it, one thing I think it is important: we have to think of resistance in a in a in a large large context. Um, and and certainly, I think that while it might be that this these particular types of slave rebellions have, or, or at least led by uh, led by men, have a strongly masculinist character, particularly. Uh, in a in a society which is martial and from a and, 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 and involving Africans who often come from with military experience, uh, it's it's very possible that a lot of enslaved women practice resistance in different sorts of ways, um, and 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 we need to remember, I guess, that the sources that we have, the sources always so so much so many of the sources come from men, so many of those sources don't think of women as serious actors. And so as, as historians, we tend to often have to replicate what the biases in our sources are. It's a very difficult thing, I think, as all of us have tried to work out, is how do we look at enslaved experience 
uh, through the through the sources which are by people who are not sensitive uh, to enslaved experiences. It's very difficult. And and and, and Vincent's idea of triangulation, I think, is a um, it's probably the best we can do, and it's a it, it's a brilliant sort of way way of looking at these things. So we have a fantastic book from Aisha Finch called Rethinking Slavery Rebellion, Rebellion in Cuba um, on women's roles in, in the course of slave rebellion in 19th century Cuba. But we also have the work of Tavolia Glimp, the recent work, which shows women soldiers in the context of the Civil War, actual infantry soldiers fighting these rebellions. So again, I think it's going to remain an old question, like how masculine in character these revolts were. We definitely know the sources saw them as masculine in character, but I think we have to keep pushing further and see what we can learn, just knowing what we know from Aisha Finch and Tavolia Glimpse work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. Uh, if I could just say that and just add, yeah. like a grandy nanny and nanny's rebellion, and mm -hmm. you know, and the same. You have the same kinds of complicated questions around gender and her as a leadership, and her that as someone who gets, you know, acres of land given to her at the end. So that's treaty. So. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to answer that one or shall I move on to the next? We have plenty of questions to ask you, so maybe I'll I'll move, I'll move on. Um, so we have a couple of questions about the kind of exp question of the explanation for the rebellions. Um, so Gad Human is asking uh, how Vince, and perhaps we could expand that to the other panelists, uh, responds to Trevor's emphasis on developments on the Jamaican plantations as opposed to the African background to explain um, the revolt. Um, and then a kind of related question, so if you wouldn't mind trying to deal with these together, um, which is from James Robertson, um, who points out that brutal overseers um, are a more general phenomenon um, uh, and, the, and says the frontier explanation seems useful, but he asks, what about the degree to uh, the degree that Tacky and Wager were both enslaved on plantations that had a tradition of rebellion? Um, there'd been a failed rising, he says, at Maysmuir in the aftermath of the treaty with Kujo. Uh, and then after Tacky, there would be further plots on, on into the 1820s. Uh, what about the state traditions uh, of rebelliousness, he's, he's asking. So those are both questions that deal with uh, causes of rebellion, I suppose. So I'll, uh, I'll throw those open to you. Um, Vince was particularly addressed, but anybody could yeah. come in on that. So the way I, I actually don't have a quarrel with Trevor's emphasis on plantations. But um, what I would like to do is see them in the broader context, as, as I think Ed is doing with the military repression of these revolts. So the metaphor I use is to see uh, slave revolts as eddies within larger currents. Right? So if one sees these kind of dynamic currents flowing in a certain direction, one can see them eddy in a particular way because the riverbed has a particular shape, right, to, pursue, to push the metaphor. Because a plantation has a particular kind of form Right, we might see these rebellions pop up um, at particular places at particular times, but that doesn't change our analysis of this current, which has to include historical experience in Africa with warfare, which has to include historical experience with the British military. Right, so one can think about Tacky's revolt as being something completely separate from these other revolts that happen along the way, but of course. You know, you mentioned uh, Trelawney's pamphlet where he talks about planters playing with edge tools. What he's responding to is a rebellious conspiracy that was supposedly led by drivers in St. John Parish, but also an actual rebellion that happened among uh, people working in the Royal Navy Yard in 1746 uh, at Port Royal. So, and those were primarily Coromante people, right, according to the news accounts, um, that had been working for the British military and actually managed to, to, to kind of escape their, their confines and head up into the mountains before they were pursued and, and captured. So if one kind of sees these larger um, currents heading into the slave revolt, one doesn't have to choose between what happened on the plantation and what happened in Africa and what happens along the way. One sees a dynamic process unfold over time in particular places. And that's the way I like to conceive not only attackers revolt, but slave revolt in general. Again, drawing attention to the larger military martial geography of the Atlantic world, 
in which these various flare-ups happen, happen at particular times. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, I'll just briefly say, yes, uh, uh, James Robertson's uh, point is, is extremely well taken. Um, why something happens on a particular plantation at a particular time is partly contingent on what kinds of information they are learning from other people. And so there's one fantastic source that I love so much, I used it twice in both of my books, which is when the planter Simon Taylor learns of uh, uh, an attempt from some brand new Africans to his plantation to rise up and stab their driver. And upon mm -hmm. interrogating them, he learns that they all know in 1806 about the revolt that happened in the 1760s, right? And he speculates, how is it if they're not planning something larger, would they all know about things that happened 40 years ago before any of the people who were on this plantation now were born? which means that there is a political history being taught and learned on Caribbean plantations that people are learning when they get to the island. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, Ed, did you want to come in? Yeah, if, if I could, um, another, another story that helps us understand this, this question is about the conspiracy in Hanover in 1776, where the, the document, they, they interrogated the rebels there, and so, and we have a lot of evidence about this conspiracy, which never became a rebellion, but it's it's, it's very interesting. And it included it included groups of Creoles, Igbos, and Coromantes, right? And so, previously, you only really see Coromantes in the evidence of those of those who are leading and participating in this rebellion. And what that says about Jamaican society is that that resistance itself and the approaches that enslaved people use. Okay, changed over time. In that relatively brief period of time, um, Igbos and Creoles became involved in the organization of, of, of organized rebellions, right? And that's a significant change. And it suggests that you're, I mean, the local and the transatlantic and the trans-imperial are all important in understanding how these things emerge. It's never going to be local or broader, right? It's going to be a combination thereof. OK, thank you. Uh, anyone else want to come in on that question? OK, um, I think this is probably best um, uh, directed to you, Lisa, from Kieran Shakeshaft. What effect or role did Taki's revolt have within the Seven Years' War that was occurring at the time? Do you want to? It's a quite a big question, but that maybe a you can pick out some, <laughs> so one some of the, highlights. So I'll, I'll say that one of the things that I found is that it affirmed the British military's employment of enslaved and free black soldiers. That, and this is something that the British military had been doing since the 1730s. So it's not as if this was new, but. Um, as a result largely of the Maroon Wars and the deployment of enslaved and free black men to suppress the wars. And then the 1739 treaties that um, incorporated the Maroons as a security force for the island of Jamaica. British officials back in London learned about um, the military prowess of men of Af African descent and determined to deploy that prowess for imperial purposes um, to the extent that they could. And this is affirmed in the Seven Years' War when enslaved and free black soldiers are deployed by the British military for offensive as well as defensive um, expeditions. So, uh, so against Martinique, against Guadeloupe, against Havana, the British military deploys soldiers of African descent and they do so quite purposefully because they many British military officials become convinced that one they need black bush fighters to counteract the black bush fighters being deployed by the French being deployed by the Spanish and also that they need black bodies to die instead of white ones mm. that the diseased environment of the tropics um, decimated uh, regular forces deployed directly from Europe. And so some 
argued we can use acclimatized North American soldiers from the mainland colonies, but some also argued we can use um, people of African descent. We can use soldiers of African descent. And so Tacky's revolt and, the, and honestly, the deployment of Maroons to suppress it which was quite successful, and the deployment of enslaved and free black soldiers to suppress it, in addition to British regulars and Marines, um, helped to affirm the particular use of men of African descent in the British military establishment. So that's what I would say in response mm -hmm. to that. Can I ask a follow-up mm -hmm. question to Lisa? Go ahead. Do have, Lisa, do you have any thoughts on why it is that historians in tell your work hadn't really squarely situated Tacky's revolt in the context of the Seven Years' War, how it is that they thought it was something separate and separable, even though, you know, some of the major figures who fought in the more famous battles in Quebec and Senegal and Guadeloupe and Martinique went straight to Jamaica to suppress this revolt. The soldiers and sailors and Marines couldn't have had any doubt. So why is the historians didn't put that together before your work? Well, my gut response is that they did not respect soldiers of African descent. <laughs> So that they they did not see them um, as military actors in or enslaved rebels as military actors in their own right. I mean, that's my that they didn't afford them the same status as a regular disciplined soldier fighting a set battle. And so, that, I mean, that's my gut response to. Your I think that has implications for how we think about women in warfare as well. So we yeah. continually have these narratives of warfare that see it as a masculine endeavor, despite the fact that the closer you get to the sources, you keep finding women popping up in combat, right, throughout history. And yet that never changes the prevailing narrative of who fights wars. I think that's so right. And that's exactly what happened to me. With, that's what's happened to me with my research, that as soon as you start looking for black soldiers, in British military records, they're everywhere. <laughs> I mean, they are absolutely everywhere. And so it's, yeah, it, it, so this kind of goes back to my earlier comments of, it depends what question you're bringing to the table, what assumptions you're bringing to the table, that changes what you see in the records and what status you afford it and whether you choose to write about it or not. And so I think you're right, Vince, to equate that with, you know, our lack of understanding of women's experience of slave rebellion or the military roles they may have played in it might be a function of our lenses more than the sources. Erica, you 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 know a lot about the Seven Years' War. Do you? I was just could, about could, to could ask Erica answer Vincent's question too. Well, I wonder um, because I think uh, Lisa makes a really good point, but also thinking about the geographic focus. Like I think, Lisa, you've, you've written about this. There's there's an interesting point about also, I think people being interested when they write about the Seven Years' War to look at Europe mm -hmm. and to look at America because of how that also dominates modern day historical approaches. And there's an interesting point about the Caribbean and how, whether or not that's central. It's clearly central for people at the time. But again, I think just to echo what Lisa's saying is, a lot of our, our assumptions about what questions we should be asking of the historical record, of the sources, how we frame our narrative, often comes from our own assumptions about how we think the world is organized. And I think the Seven Years' War is this nice point about how, again, like we've come back to this teleological issue that we sometimes struggle with with historians. So thinking about the Caribbean as actually a center of gravity um, in terms of geopolitical terms, as well as the, the actors who are involved. And I think that can explain a lot of assumptions that we see shaping a war that wasn't necessarily focused, certainly not on the Northern American colonies, but not necessarily on Europe either. I've got to tell you, in terms of kind of shifting our, our, our assumptions about what matters geographically, Trevor's article on the wealth of Jamaica is still kind of one of the best resources I can ever point to. Just looking at private physical wealth on the eve of the American Revolution and the astronomical numbers that are posted by the Jamaicans, it really you know, kind of opens up the world for people. Um, so I, I still think that that's one of the best sources we have for reorienting people's imagination about what's important in this period. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to move on um, to another question, which I think, uh, Robert, you might want to answer this one initially. 
Um, it's from Hank Gun Gonzalez, and he asks um, if you might have any insights on the uses of 18th century Gold Coast material culture for understanding the, in quotes, Coromantee, and people like Tacky and Wager. For, for example, he asks, is there anything that we can make of the so-called Akan gold from that pirate shipwreck off Cape Cod, the wider galleon, the wider galleon? Um, I don't know if you uh, uh, yeah. have that, get that reference. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I mean, you know, there are a lot of uh, <clears throat> sources that you could, you could look at. Um, I think uh, it's just, it may be important to think of it in a sort of broad way. Don't feel like you have to just use archival. Don't feel like you just have to do oral. Get a get, get a range of set of sources. If you really want to learn about, um, you know, how gold and its value and its usage uh, and how it's been sort of uh, recognized by historians, you know, like look at Thurston Shaw's study of uh, archaeology up in, uh, you know, the northern, I mean, uh, eastern Gold Coast. I mean, something like that will tell you how these materials were being used. That's a starting point. E. Kofi Agorsa, who I know everybody probably here knows, too, is a, is a great one. Where I can, it's very influential and helping even to shape my own work to, to make sense of it and to and to be careful to as as Trevor reminds of the to, to teleology you know read this thing right I mean don't don't get presumptuous uh, uh, and let let what the materials guide you um, James and Quan the the, the the gentleman I mentioned also in an, an eclectic uh, approach where he's just going to use a range of sources to arrive at a perception or an understanding of what's going on but they're they're there you you you've got to do the same sorts of look and investigations that uh, you know some of us are continuing to do on um, the Royal African records uh, some of the uh, uh, there's some Dutch records there's some Danish records <laughs> I mean if you really want to start to look uh, um, there there are a range of sources that um, yeah you can sort of begin to investigate and, and I would even say get to a particular area uh, and a particular theme um, because it's so much um, and begin to un unravel it that way um, but I think there are there there, there are, that's the way. I mean, the balancing of sources that we've talked quite a bit about in terms of some on the American side and some on the African side to make sense of what's happening is just is just a brush approach to investigate mm -hmm. any, any of this stuff. If you're going to sort of approach it from this side of this Afro-Atlantic sort of uh, a, a viewpoint, I, mean, I think that'd be very important. Can I just I, jump in quick, quickly? Can I, yeah, please do. I would love to hear Robert and Vincent talk about the mahogany sword um, that was unearthed in Kingston, um, this might be a way to get at that that question of material culture because I think mm -hmm. one of the most exciting passages I think I read in my research was Pierre Eugene du Cimetière's description of that sword. So, and I haven't traced its origins in West Africa. I don't know if I spent either. some time trying to track it down. I wanted to find it. I wanted to hold it actually. I wanted to hit something. <laughs> <laughs> but what I think happened is that kind of became part of his collection. It was in the, in the American Museum collection, and that collection burned uh, in uh -huh. the late 19th century um, because what was his collection that didn't burn came to the Peabody Museum at Harvard. And so, you know, my first thought was, you know, maybe in my backyard, um, but <laughs> I didn't find it there. I think that what happened is it, it did burn in the 19th century. So yeah, that description is fantastic, and it's kind of it's long and elaborate. It gives, it's, you know, it's all the dimensions of that. Um, but I have not seen the actual sword. I don't know if you can tell us more about its meaning symbolically, Robert. Um, you know, swords have different different meanings. I mean, uh, you know, there's a sword that falls when that forms uh, the beginning of the Denchira Empire, um, the precursor to the Ashanti. The sword falls and breaks in two, and where it falls determines how the state will, will function. Um, so, so I think they do, they, they play a role. And I think it's interesting um, where, and I forget the exact account, where they're, they're having a John Canoe celebration and someone's waving a sword sort of strangely. And it's just sort of, you guys, you know, the look. It's, I got the idea of the look. Like some of the people understood exactly what was going on. He wasn't just dancing with that sword. He was, he was conveying something there. I like that idea of the usage of a ceremonial sword in that context, because you have a, a range of uses, and that's not a sword that you would necessarily see brought out on a battlefield. You know, it, it, it has different sort of meaning. So, so yeah, I mean, super interesting, super interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, question, uh, quite a specific one uh, from Winston Hill, uh, which might be uh, Trevor, perhaps, or Ed. Um, about um, 
the compensation that planters uh, who suffered, in quotes, damages during the revolt might have received. Um, he asked at what level were they compensated, who paid the compensation, and what are the implications of that? I'll leave that to you, Abe, but I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't have numbers at my fingertips, um, but the law does mandate that when a when a slave is condemned for death for a rebellious or, or some sort of crime, the planter is to be paid. And there is evidence in the colonial records of these payments happening um, mm -hmm. across time. I, I I don't think I look I don't think I asked that question when I was in the archives about Tacky's rule in particular. Um, and the survival of these records of expenditures is is not always consistent. Um, you very well might find it. It, it very well might be there. Um, but I know it was a matter of law for purchasers to be paid when their slaves rebelled and were executed as a result. There are two great articles on uh, compensation claims for executed rebels by David Barry Gaspar. Both of them mm -hmm. focus on uh, 19th century Antigua. Uh, the number that's occurring to me for, for executed rebels in Jamaica is 40 pounds. And I'm not sure if that's late 18th century or if it's already 40 pounds in 1760. But, but as Ed is saying, um, yes, when the state condemned uh, your enslaved human property, they would generally pay you some compensation, rarely the total value uh, uh, of that property, but they would pay you something. And that was in order to encourage people to actually yield over um, to the state, uh, people that the state considered troublemakers. So despite the fact that you know, the state was comprised mostly of planters and merchants right, and wealthy people, there was still a public interest that diverged sometimes and somewhat from the private interest of each individual planters. And so that compensation was about trying to kind of harness the private interest to the public good, what they thought was the public good. Mm -hmm. One of the I things that I was so, so one um, of the things that is Trevor always been interesting to me. So one of the things I've always been interesting to me is what happened to the uh, the enslaved rebel, the rebels who were transported, many of whom I think went to British Honduras and Mosquito Shore, mm -hmm. and and they and and I I think that that many of them would have been involved in. Um, uh, going back to the mahogany tour to in, in producing mahogany um, and, and formed, a, formed, formed something which in, in, a, in, a, in a colony which was always thought of as particularly troublesome and, and, and rebellious and you always wonder what the connections might be. Yeah. Lisa, Lisa might know. Oh I don't although that has always fascinated me as well I've always and I think I can't remember but I feel like someone was writing about that I can't remember off the top of my head, but I thought that that would be an amazing project to try to yeah. trace those rebels. And, and there, was, there was a slave rebellion in 1765 in British Honduras, the territory is now Belize, um, mm -hmm. which conceivably could have been led or at least um, included survivors of Tacky's revolt. Um, and I was able to trace one ship to, to, I think, Norfolk, Virginia, actually, one ship of people who had been condemned uh, and transported along with the Royal Navy convoy up to North America. But what happened to them when they got to Virginia, I don't know. Wow. I just wanted to quickly add to the um, topic of conversation on compensation that planters were also compensated for those enslaved people who fought on behalf of the colonial order and died um, mm -hmm. or were awarded their freedom um, as a result of their service to the colony. So that was another um, layer of compensation that planters received. Um, at first, planters were also received for um, paying the Maroons to actually go out and fight because in, in many instances, the Maroons refused to actually um, track down rebels or runaways because they were owed money um, by the state and they weren't ready to move with alacrity until they had been paid. And sometimes they just said, we're not gonna go um, if we don't receive additional compensation. And so individual planters would pay them to go out. And at first the state would compensate those individual planters and then they stopped because they didn't want to perpetuate um, the Maroons being able to get additional payment for their services. So those, that, those are just additional comments on the comment, that mm -hmm. topic. Okay, thank you. Um, 
We have a couple of questions about the kind of aftermath or the long-term aftermath of, of Taki's revolt. Um, one is from Lorena Arrocha, and she asks, how important was this revolt in the collective imaginary of peoples of African descent in Jamaica, uh, and in particular for people involved in future revolts? Um, and then Joe Dillon asks, um, did Taki's revolt influence the Haitian revolution in 1791? So uh, slightly, slightly separate questions, but um, similar themes. So I don't know who would like to, to, um, to respond to those. Does anybody have knowledge? Well, of I'll, I'll, let, I'll let someone else respond to the first question, but this, which is a very, very good one. The second question, just very briefly, is that I think it has a quite significant Im impact on the Haitian Revolution. And it has so, I guess, in two ways. It, it, it has, for, I think, on the people who were enslaved in, ha in, in, in Saint-Domingue and ha Haiti. So I might want to talk on that as, as well. But I think it also has a, 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 a very significant effect uh, on the planters uh, in Saint-Domingue, because what they learned was a very different lesson than what was learned in metropolitan Britain and France. For, for the metropolitan French, Tacky's rebellion just showed uh, was further confirmation of how appalling the British were, how cruel, how dreadful they were. Um, typical, typical, what you might say, French-British uh, reactions. The French planters, what they were most impressed were, with was the was the response of the Jamaican state and planters, which seemed to convince them that if only they could be as 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 single-minded as able to do whatever they liked to their enslaved people uh, in Saint-Domingue as planters in Jamaica might be able to do, that they would be able to keep themselves safe. So for Jamaica, for, so for, so for, for Saint-Domingue planters, uh, the, the lesson of Taki's revolt was um, a very perverse one, which is if you were determined to, 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 to fight uh, slave resistance with maximum violence, that would work. Hmm, interesting. And of course, um, Vince, you already to some extent addressed this question when you were talking a little while ago about the, the Simon Taylor letter. So I don't know if you want to say anything more um, or anybody else wants to come in. Oh, that's somebody else. Okay. I mean, I think there is, you got like a continuum that, uh, you know, Vince has sort of highlighted that that could be going on um, in this process. And I think it involves more than slaves. I think in, in some ways you can consider some of what the Maroons do as influential to some of what mm -hmm. will happen at the end of uh, Taki's uh, um, um, rebellion. I, I mean, and I think it does fit into a sort of continuity of those things. I think, uh, yeah, there, I mean, I was just looking at a time that the, the chronology of all the revolts in Jamaica, and if you just look at something like that very quickly, you start to see um, there's some consistency in terms of uh, resistance and, and response and reactiveness to, to, to what's happening. So. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't think you should see it completely as part of a series, as again we, we've sort of stressed, but definitely there's some continuity, there's some features there that are that are at work over time. Mm -hmm. I, I just, just add one point, I guess. Sorry, just what I add one point is that Julius Scott wrote a great book in the Common Wind, which talks about how news of the Haitian Revolution spread among enslaved people throughout the Caribbean, throughout the Atlantic world, pretty quickly. Um, I'd be very surprised if that didn't happen with Taki's Revolt as well. Uh, enslaved people of African descent moved around the Atlantic world, as as, as Vincent and Rob, as all as all, everyone's been saying, um, much more than we've expected. And they would have talked, they would have heard about it, and they would have come to their own conclusions about it. I presume. You know, and, and just to highlight the importance of of attending to that, um, I'll go back to something Trevor said about the the French response to the British suppression of Taki's revolt. You know, ironically, perversely, Edward Long in his 1774 History of Jamaica praised the French for having a slave society which was far less rebellious, far more under control, and thought, well, maybe it's because, you know, they allow their enslaved people to be Catholics, right? And that, you know, because Catholicism is tyrannical in the Protestant view, that helps to control the enslaved. Of course, he's writing this, just publishing this just 15 years before the Haitian Revolution which I think just highlights the fact that, you know, planter sources can't tell us everything. <laughs> they, they, they didn't actually know what was going on. We have to go beneath those planter sources and, and do the imaginative work to figure out what the slaves might have known. Um, does anyone else want to come in now? Or we have a few time for a few more questions. Um, I'm going to go to a question um, from Deirdre Osborne. 
um, which is primarily addressed to you, Vince, but I think could be more widely um, uh, answered. She asks if you've considered the Atlantic Crypt model developed by Simon Gikandi to um, explore um, slave ship logs and um, goes on to explain how that's a, a model ask, that asks how African agency and freedom can be located in places of internment, the deep crypts in which master's words buried them. Um, so including things like the ship lo ship's log. So how do we deal with the conceptual limit of no uh, names, just numbers, um, which come out of the inventory intended to encase them in the Atlantic crypt? Is that a, a model that well, I mean, I can you speak, guys find I can speak, useful? I can speak briefly, briefly on that, and it goes back to something I said before, which is that, again, these sources are never worlds under themselves for me. They're indications of processes that I'm trying to explore and trying to explain, right? So, you know, the fact that, you know, I have a particular name or a particular, you know, count of bodies in that particular source is never what I assume is the only thing that matters, right? That's just an artifact of a larger process that I'm trying to explain. And so I look to other sources. Um, certainly in the case of uh, kind of Anglophone slavery and even, even Dutch slavery, where you know, the English are primarily concerned with counting things, right? We have a certain understanding of what those sources can tell us. But if we look to Iberian sources, where they have an inquisition, right? Where an absolutist state you know, has the concern to control the soul of the enslaved as well, we learn different things about them from those sources. And by reading across those sources, as Professor Hanser does, reading across you know, British sources and, and African sources, but we learn something more about those people and those processes that is not limited to the, the kind of encasement that, um, that a list on a British ship would, would, would have us believe is the limitation of the source. So again, the source is just an indication of something broader that I want to understand uh, I never really stop with the limitations of that source, even as I understand that sources do shape and constrain our knowledge, right? That to me is just a spur, a goad, a prompt to triangulate, as, as, as Trevor indicated, uh, among multiple sources to see if I can develop a better picture of the process that's, that's underli underlying those sources. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for um, one last question, which I'm, I'm going to combine two questions that have come in, um, and both of them deal with the kind of longer term legacy of, of these events and how we should think about them in the present day. Um, so Eleanor Nicholson asks what you would want school children to learn about the history of enslaved people, and we could say perhaps specifically about the history of Taki's revolt. And um, Sami Pina Basi asks if there are any statues dedicated to the people involved in Taki's revolt, and if not, should there be? A very topical question. So maybe everyone could have a, a, a go at answering either or both of those um, questions and, uh, as a, a final uh, round. Um, uh, Lissa, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, so I think, and I'll just speak from my perspective within the United States here that the United States has not done a good job of facing um, its slaveholding past um, within the education system and within the public sphere. And we're reckoning with that at present. And, and that's very important. I think, so the question of what should school children learn about slavery, I think school children, right now learn about heroes who opposed slavery like Harriet Tubman, for instance, or they learn, and, or, and it, to the extent that they learn about slavery at all. I think more so they learn about the civil rights movement and they learn about those people who struggled against segregation. Um, I think we need far more attention to slavery and I think we need to start it young with elementary school children. Uh, I think that children should understand what enslaved people experienced and so how enslaved people came to fight and to combat um, the subjection, the subjugation they were forced to endure. I'll just 
say that generally. So in, in other words, not just heroes without a, their context. I would like to see a little bit more facing what it is that people endured. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to Robert. I'm just going around the order I can see you on my screen now. Who wants to well, I mean, address? you know, I'm coming to you live from the south side of Chicago. Hey. That there are some things happening here, and it's really become a sort of centerpiece of what's unfolding. And and I just think, you, you know, this is a story. It's an important one. But, but you know, and, and it needs to be told. There's so many stories that need to be told. Everyone who talks to me when I teach hears me say that. You know, there's all these stories that, are, that need to be told. But I like the idea of telling them in different disciplinary forms. Um, I like, like uh, Trevor Gertz did the thing, the comic book, mm -hmm. Bina and the Important Men. I thought that was very compelling as a way to tell a narrative. Uh, or, or even, you know, some other folks' work in film and in literature and other things. Uh, that might be an important sort of thing to consider in the context of all of this. And then the other thing I would just add is just, you know, the polemics. Just, I mean, they, they, it's there and it's present. And we, it's, 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 it, we want to readily equivocate these rebellions and these moments to maybe some of what's happening here and now. But that's a real process. We got to walk that. You got to walk that over there. If you're going to do that, walk it there. Because otherwise, you're going to run into real, real, real problems. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that doesn't mean that it's not valuable and that we shouldn't know as a legacy that people have fought and resisted the slave trade from day one. We should know that. There's no need for us. We should, that should be part of historical records, particularly in America. But, but, but it, it, it still doesn't mean, it, it, you know, we've got to be careful. You know, there's something to be said for catharsis to some degree, I think, uh, in the context of making sense of this. Other folks have struggled. Build on these struggles that others have, mm -hmm. have started. There, there, there's a lot. It's, it's a careful process. We've got to take it very careful. And, and maybe part of that might just be tuning down the politic politics. Um, Erica, would you like to come in? I can I can try to come in. Obviously, I think there's no straightforward answers. But one thought I did have is obviously the discussions in Britain right now. I think one of the major points we see is not just thinking about teaching slavery, but how to understand slavery within broader histories, right? So to see it as something that's fundamental to British imperial history and how that might reshape our broader understandings also of how we think about empire. I've been really struck by how um, a lot of the discussion I think we have as academic historians, our move when we write about history has been to move away individuals and to move away these kind of narratives of of an individual shaping history, and yet we're having discussions still about what then we do when we're thinking about statues or public history. And the same thing, I think, when we think about empire, I think a lot of the historiography we talk about is about empire being everywhere, even for people at home in Britain who never went to the colonies. And so to think about how to incorporate in a notion of slavery underpinning those kind of at-home experiences of empire and whether there's a way that we can work harder as academic historians to, to rethink those fundamental narratives. I mean, I also was thinking um, that the military history aspect is an interesting one because I think this is something that underplays a lot of what everyone has been talking about. And Vincent's website, this kind of way of, of redrawing a military history to think about these revolts within a broader, um, uh, more accessible way of thinking, rethinking the history of wars, rethinking military histories, because I'm also very aware that military history is an area that has a very um, interested public audience. So how do we also rethink that area, right? So not just national histories, but military histories too, to incorporate some of these stories. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Vince? Yeah, so for me, kind of the most inspiring uh, aspects of a British or an American story is the struggle against tyranny and for freedom and human flourishing. I think that struggle is still very important. That, that story is very important. And how can you tell that story without telling the story of the struggle against slavery uh, and valorizing that? The age of statuary, I think, is kind of aligned with the celebration of power and wealth 
Uh, but if what we want to be celebrating as societies is less power and wealth than freedom and the struggle against tyranny and human flourishing, then we're going to have to rethink how we actually celebrate those values. Um, statues may not be the best way to do it, as Erica was saying. Um, but when we do that, we're going to understand again that that's just not a national history. It's not, that's not just the history of the UK or Great Britain, Britain or England or the United States. States. United States. So that is mm -hmm. a, a human history. We've got to figure out a way to incorporate the global struggle against tyranny. Your sound to me, English. anyway, has come gone very strange. Um, I don't know if that was just me or for everybody. Um, so well, I, I hope finished. people. Okay. Um, I think I think it was it was clear. I, it is seven o'clock, but I'm just going to give Trevor and Ed a chance to to respond to those final questions and then say one or two words to 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 wrap up. Um, Ed, do you want to come in? Well, just briefly, I, I think it's incredibly important that we continue to teach the history of slavery, but also to teach this, this about this tradition of resistance to to slavery, and that that's that's really so important. Um, I mean, when Simon Taylor writes a letter about uh, a newly enslaved African who is acting upon the, the example set by his predecessor in 1760, that's astonishing, right? That is a political tradition that, that is a part of African-American history across the Atlantic world that we need, to, we need to keep that story going. We need to teach that history um, every day to students across this country and across the Atlantic. I don't Thank know about you. the statues question. I don't know if there's any statues to tacky. Vince, do you know? Are any, Trevor, are there any statues? I, so I should, I should call out, there is a movement to make Tacky a national hero in Jamaica, um, mm -hmm. especially led by the activist Derek Black X Robinson, who's been very engaged in trying to make Tacky a national hero. But as far as statues, I don't know. Thanks. Um, Trevor, well, I'll be very brief. I think, I think, I, I think it would be good, tacky, tacky being a national hero, or Tacky having a statue is good, but being historians, we'd probably dispute it because we'd probably want to have Wager as the, or a Pongo as the, as, as, as the real leader. Um, and, but I just want to end with him because what, what in, terms of, in terms of what we wanted to, to say to, to, to students, I think one of the things that comes out of all the books that, that my colleagues have, have written, which are all fantastic books uh, and fantastic articles, um, they're, they're real page turners because this is an exciting story. Uh, well, what, it talk, what it talks about is something which is a, a really interesting event. Uh, whatever else you might want to think about it in, in, in regards to slavery, in terms of empire, um, and, and in terms of a really interesting country, which is Jamaica. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and um, we are coming to the end now. I just want to thank um, uh, all of our wonderful panelists and our commentator, uh, and also the the fantastic audience. Um, it's always odd because you can't see the audience in in events like this, but uh, it's been great getting all your all your questions. Um, the event has been recorded and the Wilberforce Institute will release a permanent link to the recording in the next few days. So look out for that on uh, their social media. Um, I've also been asked to draw your attention to the next Wilberforce Institute webinar, which will be advertised again through social media. Uh, fascinating topic, ethical capitalism in the Atlantic world. Uh, perhaps that needs a question mark. Um, it concerns the first movements uh, in the early 19th century, uh, which alerted consumers uh, to how the things that they bought were produced. Uh, and it will be based on an evaluation of the new book by Bronwell Everall of the University of Cambridge, uh, Not Made by Slaves, Ethical Capitalism in the Age of Abolition, which I think is being released in September. Uh, the panel will include Professor John Oldfield, who was formerly the director of the Wilberforce Institute, and Professor Suzanne Schwartz of the University of Worcester, and it will be in mid-August, so do look out for that. Uh, so thank you again to everybody, and uh, that's, that's the end of the event. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.